Good afternoon. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are grateful to join together in another noon Bible study. And we're thankful that you have joined with us. We invite you now to uh, share this study with others so that they can be a part of what's being a blessing to your life as we dive deep into God's Word. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we thank you today for this opportunity to study your Word. We continue to desire your Word, to yearn for your Word, uh, uh, we, we hunger and thirst for your word. And God, as we do so, Lord God, feed us with your word. Quench the thirst of our lives with your word. May your word be alive and living and active in our lives, doing all that your word has declared it would do in us. That we would be more like Christ. That we would yield our lives greater to you. That in the fullness of all that we are, we will live to the glory of you. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Today we'll be in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And last week we discussed and shared uh, looking at uh, a misplaced confidence uh, where we can sometimes place our confidence in things other than God and we can find ourselves being discouraged, finding ourselves defeated, uh, finding ourselves despaired because we have believe greatly on some people, on some careers. We believe greatly on uh, uh, some things that we possessed, and those things did not yield anywhere near what God abundantly and fully provides and, and gives to our lives. So we dealt with that misplaced confidence and looked at where we should place our confidence last week. We want to continue with this, this focus, this theme of confidence, and, and talk about today uh, study today through the Word of God, remaining confident, working the Word in your life, remaining confident. How do I remain confident in God's Word? How do I see God's Word working in my life today? Uh, there's a story, a matter of fact, there's, it's, a, it's a, a child's children's story, a book written about a farmer. And this farmer, uh, he had a need for a worker. And so he went to town and he put out that he was looking for someone to help him work on his farm. And several young men came to him, the first of whom said to him, I can sleep in a storm. And so the farmer looked at him and was puzzled because the young man didn't talk about the work he had done and the work he was able to do. He didn't talk about his uh, skills. He didn't talk about uh, the places he had worked before, he only told him, I can work in a storm. I, I can sleep through a storm. So that farmer, puzzled by what that young man said, went on and met other young men in town, and he talked to them, and they talked about they worked on so-and-so's farm, and they had done this at that farm. They had worked in town, that they knew how, how to get around. They talked about all of these things, but the words of that young man who said, I can sleep in a storm, stuck with him. And therefore, he went back to that young man and he said, I want to give you an opportunity to work for me. And so he took the young man back to his farm. The young man proved to be very diligent, hardworking. He, he was always getting things done. He was always on top of things. And so as he saw this young man working, the farmer knew he had made the right choice. However, a storm came. And when that storm came, this farmer jumped up in anxiousness. He arose in frantic uh, frustration because he knew there was a storm and that there was much to do and he could not get the young man who said, I can sleep through a storm to wake up. He was so frustrated with them and he shook his bed. He called his name. He yelled and the young man would not get up. And after discovering that this young man would not do anything to respond, anything he could do to get up, get him up, the farmer then proceeds to go and do the work he felt needed to be done himself. He goes out to the barn, however, and finds all the horses were in their stable. He goes out to the other side of the barn and he sees the cows were resting within the barn as well. He saw outside that the bales of hay had been strapped down, things had been covered, the equipment and all and he saw that there was no work for him to do. And therefore, he remembered in that moment the words of the young man who said, I can sleep through a storm. 
The next morning at breakfast, he told, he looked at the young man and said, now I understand why you could sleep through a storm. He said, because you took care of everything that needed to be done before the storm came, so you weren't worried about the storm when it happened. The young man said, I learned early in my life to be dependable on what I do so that when storms come, I can rest well. And we sometimes don't realize that God is just like that young man, faithful to his word. His word is dependable for us. And God has done and has fulfilled his promises through this word to the point we don't have to wake up frantic and anxious, but that we can rely completely on the word of God to lead and guide and direct our lives that we might remain confident. However, today we live in a world and in a society that many do not think that the Bible has the capability to respond to life's complexities, nor do they trust that scripture is able to speak to such a sophisticated society. And it's amazing that we have those who between the complexities of life and the sophistication that they see in our society do not see God's word as relevant. They don't see God's word as relevant, and therefore, they, they, they don't think that they can get what God's word gives truly in the way of wisdom, in the way of direction, in the way of understanding how to navigate life. Therefore, they'd rather try to do it on their own. They'd rather choose other philosophies and philosophers. They'd rather sit down and try to reason life out. And so in all of these things, they're still stuck within the complexities of life because they've tried to figure out other ways of navigating life. Some say our society is so sophisticated and that almost is a satire uh, great humor because if we look at our society today, the sophistication that we flaunt or that people go around talking about they have, we're not as sophisticated as we think we are. Yes, we have technology of AI. Yes, we're a, we have computers. Yes, we even have the ability to do things such as how we're sharing this study right now through a live stream while persons are here, even in the sanctuary in person at the same time to teach God's word and to share God's word in a great way. However, with all that we can do in these impressive ways, there's still a great deal of ignorance and arrogance that is in our society that makes us have to laugh at thinking we're so sophisticated. However, there are those who do not believe the Bible can speak to our time. And that can be troubling because at times where we don't hear or we don't see where the Bible uh, is being recognized by many, sometimes it can put pressure on the few that are still trusting and taking God at his word. It can put a frustration and a burden on us because it can make us sometimes feel like, are we really taking and trusting God in the fullness of what his word says? Are we really confident and certain that God's word will never fail us yet? And while we wrestle with that in our reality, it's because of what we're dealing with, because of the trials that we face that may not work out the way we want them to, but they somehow always work out the way God, the way God intends them to, that we can find ourselves wrestling with our own confidence in God's word. Then we have to deal with and navigate a world that also introduces us to things that can contend for our confidence in God's word, such as a moralism, and where people think that God's word is a legalism, where we take the Bible only for how to behave. The Bible is just telling you how to be good, how, how to do the right thing. And if we only see the Bible as a book on how to behave, we're no better than the Pharisees and the Sadducees who tried to input, impress upon the people that they were to live certain ways in order to experience God. And even if we consider what Jesus experienced and encountered, where even the Sabbath, uh, and Jesus had to tell them that man was made, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, we see how legalism creeped in to the law that Jesus came to uphold by the people 
who thought that they were doing right by a law that they were really misusing. And so if we saw that happen with those who were of the religious of Jesus' day, there are those today who have no religion and some who do have religion who think we're supposed to take the Bible and hit people with it and, and, and press it on them and tell them this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you should be. And we push it to a point where it tells people how to behave, but not how to have a relationship with God. So we have those who are impressed upon us, even in the church, we have those who see legalism in scripture that can cause us to wonder, is the word of God a word that I can put my full trust in? But then we have the pragmatism, the pragmatic view that also impresses upon us some challenges because those with a pragmatic view say whatever works, works. And their view of whatever works means that they try to determine uh, and navigate life by, by whatever reason, whatever ideals, whatever principles or practices that are not consistent within the Word of God, but that are within whatever religion or religions in society suggest. And therefore, when you live in a whatever works mindset, that means today this may work, tomorrow that may work, tomorrow I'll try the next thing or try the new thing or the fad or the trend that may be the thing everybody's doing right now. In other words, pragmatic, pragmatic persons can treat the Bible almost like we treat diets. There's a new diet craze today we want to take on because I want to lose five pounds in five minutes. Tomorrow I want to take on this weight loss opportunity because it's going to keep all the fat off me for the rest of my life, so they say. Or I'm going to drink more water with lemon and orange because it's going to help me slim down and fit and look good for the summer. All of those things can be like the pragmatic view, finding what works for the moment and trying to work with that. And that's another view that sometimes is impressed upon believers as we seek to maintain our confidence in the word of God. But there's also relativism. Relativism is those who have different views of what is right or wrong. You may have heard the most popular term nowadays that people say, own your own truth. Own your own truth. In other words, you be the judge, you be the determinant of what truth is, and you live that truth out. However, if your truth is true today, will your truth be true tomorrow? So we see relativism, although it impresses or pushes against us to try to get us to view or accept their ideas or their practices, it can also fall short of the power of the truth of the word of God, but yet it doesn't mean we don't experience or encounter this kind of pushback from the world according to the word that we seek to hold on to, the word we seek to know and trust in, as the psalmist said, the word we've hid in our heart that we might not sin against God. So in a world of moralism, in a world of pragmatism, in a world of relativism, we can find ourselves at times wrestling with our remaining confidence in God's word. And that's why we must always consider the dependability of God's word for how we live, for what it tells us about God and our relationship with him, all that he has promised, all that he's fulfilled, all that is yet to come for our lives, all that will be. Who Jesus is to us and who we are to God through Jesus Christ and how God has done all that he can to save and redeem us. We need to know and be confident in the word of God in a world that has many other views that want to deny what scripture teaches to us. Therefore, so we get to the word of 2 Timothy. It's the second letter Paul writes to his young protege, the one he mentors in ministry, whom Paul has set at Ephesus some time ago and was ministering there. Yet Paul had seen the growth and seen the opportunities of where he could continue to support and help Timothy continue to grow in ministry. And so when we consider Paul's relationship with Timothy, it shows us that through these letters, Paul sought to be pastoral to a pastor. And after, as we consider the pastoral epistles of 1 and 2 Timothy that Paul has written, we can find that Paul saw a major concern for the life of Timothy in this second letter in which he wrote to him. And he sought, therefore, to combat Timothy's temptation 
to walk away from the truth of God's word. Paul said he had to write this letter because he could see, based on what Timothy was experiencing, there was a temptation to walk away from the truth of God's word. Here's why. In this time, Nero, who was the emperor in Rome, had, had, had found a way to blame the Christians for his own wrongdoing. And therefore, when he blamed the Christians for his own wrongdoing, he began to persecute the Christians. And so in persecuting the Christians, many who believed God's word, many who ministered God's word, were backing up from God's word. And when they began to back up from God's word, Paul saw that Timothy was becoming a little timid and becoming a little complacent when it came to God's word. And Paul said, I've got to help you understand that God's word is still truth. And regardless of what's happening in the world, you have to still stand for truth, even in tough times. And that touches us all, because if we consider the times we live in today, you go on social media, you see people who are often sharing things or trying to uh, 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 set themselves up as subject matter experts. Those who are skeptics, who seem to think they know how to debunk the word or, or create the, uh, a, a, an idea that scripture, the Bible, is myth. You also have those who question and critique the, the ability for God's word to be true because of the moral failures they see in the church. So we have very people who look and poke and point fingers at what we believe of the word of God. And after a while, the pressure becomes so great, the, 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 the arguments become so intense that sometimes we can want to fall back from the word of God ourselves. We can find ourselves not even wanting to walk in the fullness of the word of God, the, the assurance of the word of God, to see that God had a plan of redemption from the beginning through the word of God. And we get caught up and then we don't take time also to study God's word, to know God's word being true for us, that we can stand in God's word for what it means to us. Paul saw that being an issue for Timothy, but he also saw it uh, and helps us to see it that being a challenge for us today. And therefore, Paul said, I've got to help combat the temptation of walking away from the truth of God's word. But also, Paul wrote because he wanted to confirm Timothy's confidence in scripture that he would remain faithful to it and his calling. Pastor Timothy was struggling. Pastor Timothy was going through. But not only was it Pastor Timothy going through, it was Timothy as a person himself. Child, believer in God, who grew up and, he can, and was doing great ministry and was doing great things for the Lord. And, and as a person, Paul shows that intimate concern, not only for the calling of what it meant to minister the word to others, but the calling of Christ on his life of which he is saved and walking in his salvation. So therefore, Paul said to help Timothy deal with these times, I pen these words, but also he does it so that when we read God's word, we can glean from what Paul wrote to Timothy, how it helps us to remain confident in God's word. Therefore, the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, Paul says to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continuing what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man, woman of God, Man is used in the generic sense of man and woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So for us to grab hold of this text, I want us to look at something uh, 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 to help us kind of shape this. And I know you study the word. I'm sure you've heard some terms used of how uh, 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 to, to understand what the word of God, what the Bible is. 
Uh, but I want to go back and I want to give a working definition. So you may have a definition. You may agree with my definition. You may expound upon it or you may lessen it. But I wanted to see if I could capture a good definition for us to understand and grasp what's the Bible. What's the Bible? What is the Bible? Because oftentimes we read God's word. We say the Bible is God's word. Amen, it is. It is God's word. But what's the Bible? And so here's a definition. The Bible is the inspired word of God. That is infallible, meaning has no fault, and inerrant, meaning has no error. And it presents God's work of redemption in the world and through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not a good definition. Jesus is the central theme and character of all of Scripture. And through Jesus, we come to know God. So therefore, we can say, we can't have Scripture without Jesus, and we can't have Jesus without Scripture. How's that work? Can, 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 does that help us to kind of think, think this thing through? Because if we're going to have confidence in the word, we've got to know what the Bible is. We've got to know what it is to read through the Pentateuch. We've got to know what it is to read uh, uh, through the time when Joshua comes on the scene and Judges and Ruth. We've got to know what those scriptures help us to understand and what God was revealing through that time and through those experiences. We have to understand how the praises of the Psalms were so personal and so intimate to God and how there were so many ways that they could see God in their struggles but also seek God for God to take out retribution against those that had wronged them. How they could petition and they could repent how they could praise and they could pursue promises, how they could lift up their voices, but yet let their tears fall at the same time. And how we can then move through the prophets and hear the prophets declare that there was one who was coming, the Messiah, the anointed one, to know that God would, would restore and redeem his people and that <clears throat> he would make salvation available for all the world and then get to the Gospels and, and, and race to Bethlehem and see a babe born in a manger and hear about this one who that was to come into the world born of a Virgin Mary and how that babe born of a Virgin Mary would then grow to his own ministry but yet have his ministry heralded by one named John the Baptist. And how disciples would become and of men and there would be women who would walk with Jesus. And through that time, they'd grow and come to know Jesus. And they would go with Jesus to a place they did not think they would come to. His death. And so his death seemed to be final. His burial seemed to be final. Until they experienced resurrection. And began to then know the power of the resurrection that would be at work in them. The Holy Spirit that Jesus, he would ask the Father to send. And then they would have this move of the church. First being called the way. Then becoming the church. Expanding and growing. And an apostle named Paul would come on the scene and minister and share. And we continue to see how the unfolding of the gospel continue to work in our lives and how we would live in relationship to God and how we're called to obedience to the testimony and the witness of scripture and how we look forward to revelation that coming back again of our Lord and Savior and when all shall be done and judgment shall come in the world. Genesis to Revelation, we see this redemptive work of God, but we've got to understand what's the Bible for us to embrace fully what it brings us into of the knowledge of God, the truths of God, the wonders of God. And in that place, we then, with a definition that works well, can then begin to pursue how we remain confident even in times of crisis, in times of criticism, in times of conflict, we still hold to the word of God because his word is truth. So with that working definition, 
Let's dive into something, some things about this text, because where we take on God's word completely, we've got to know that we can remain confident that God's word has authority. God's word has authority. The authority of God's word means that, that there is no greater word than the word of God. Nothing is greater than the word of God. God's word we know was spoken in creation, showing us his creative authority. God's word has been spoken in covenant, so we know God's keeping of his word and authority. I believe it's Psalm 118, 89, that talks about God's word being above everything, but yet in all things. So that means God's word has an establishment that shows forth its authority. And when we trust in the authority of God's word, we are trusting in the authority of God's person. If you go speeding down the street and a police officer who pulls you over, woo, and you pull over, you get out of your vehicle. That police officer proceeds to come to your car and says, I clock you going over the speed limit. You can go back and forth with that officer if you want to, but he has the authority to uphold the speed limit that you have broken. His word has authority according to what he has that deems him in that authority to then uphold the punishment or the correction for what you did that was in error according to that speed limit. 65 and a 35, if he's got you clocked, you can't argue. It's his authority. Government, when it comes, it's tax time, April 16th, get your taxes done. And, 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 and we have to do this, and some people try not to do it, and then find out the hard way. But if you do it, it's because what? Government has the authority to set these things in place that we must comply with what? The standards of government's authority. We don't like it, but we'll do it. We didn't like the ticket we got, but we had to take it. Why? Because we're willing to comply with the authority that is dictated in those places. But it's strange to me how we don't mind complying with that authority, but we struggle with complying and taking God fully at his word in his authority. Sometimes we, we, we only want God's word where it applies or where we can see where it gives us what we want, but does not make us who God says we ought to be. So when we want to remain confident in God's word, we struggle because we don't accept fully the authority of God's word. But if we do, then we can find even in the most challenging times that God's word will sustain us God's word will keep us. God's word will supply us. God's word will direct us. But we've got to trust in the authority of God's word. Then I think about the ability of God's word. Y'all ever thought about the, how able God's word is? See, that's amazing because when we think about the ability of God's word, we're thinking about the fact that when, when God spoke, things happened. When he said, let there be light, there was light. God said, let us make man. God didn't have a, he didn't go talk to anybody. God had a conversation among himself. The word, Hebrew word in there is Elohim, which is the plural, which means the show where we get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God was present to himself, with himself, and had conference by himself. He didn't call us. He didn't call another planet. He didn't call another solar system. He didn't call, he didn't call the great beyond of anything else. God is all in all himself. And God had the ability in his word to speak and things happen. So if God in his ability to speak within Genesis, we can discover that he was able to speak to cause things to happen, to bring into creation the world we live in, we ought to trust the ability of God's word, not only for what he created then, but also for the salvation we have. Because if God could speak and cause things to come into creation, and God could fulfill the promise of his word alone, God also has fulfilled the promise of our saving work in Christ Jesus. And therefore, when we trust the ability of God's word then to save us, we ought to also trust the ability of God's word to direct us and to 
lead us and to give us understanding and to give us what we need for us who live in this sophisticated society. Therefore, when we trust God's word and its ability, it's because we know God's word has authority and therefore we then rest in the assurance of God's word. And as the hit songwriter would say, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Taking at the word means that we know that we have a true assurance that everything in the word speaks to everything we need and gives us all that we could ever have in Christ Jesus for living in this world today. Therefore, we can remain confident because we have the authority of God's word, the ability of God's word, and the assurance of God's word. And these things Paul is impressing upon Timothy in our text. Paul is impressing them upon Timothy and saying, Timothy, you've got to know this, that you live in the, the true understanding that the temptation is always there, but don't give in to the temptation to give up on the word of truth you know, but to grab hold of it and hold tighter and be more convinced and be more convicted, to communicate, to live it, and to experience it for yourself in all that's happening in your life right now. Therefore, we learn from Timothy, Paul's conversation with him, that God's word, we ought to be confident. First of all, in times of conflict. It's right there in verse 12 and 13. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. Mm. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It sounds like familiar words that Jesus told the disciples. He said, in this life you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have what? Overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. So Paul is saying that you're going to face persecution and you're going to find these times difficult and the conflicts grow great. And you're going to have to know that if you're going to live this godly life, you've got to expect it to happen. So the first thing we want to learn from this text to help us be confident in and maintain that confidence for and through in our lives of God's word, we got to know we're going to face some times where people just ain't going to like what the will of God we trust in. They're not going to like it. They're going to talk against it. They're going to wonder why you always at the church or why you doing what you do, why you serving the way you do, why you going over here and visiting the sick and why you're praying with people. Now, they're not going to, if you want to live a godly life, just know right now, you're going to go through it. And that's important for us to know because sometimes people get saved and think that the situation that was before they were saved is just going to go away. When you get saved, the situation you had before you were saved that was causing you a problem is going to be intensified now because you're trying to live a life in Christ Jesus that is godly, that's towards God because you know that you're not the same person you were before you got saved. The people who you dealt with, the job you were on, the, the situations that you face, they're going to be intensified now and you're going to face more backlash from them. Why? Because you're trying to live this life of, in Christ that is different from how you lived before you were saved. See, before you were saved, you could deal with that situation. You might have let somebody know about themselves. You, you might have put, you know, went outside and, and handled it like men, as they would say, or handled it like ladies, you know, take these earrings off. I'm going to handle this. That's how you handle it then. But when you live a godly life, the persecution will intensify. Why? Because people will see you differently than how you were known before. Therefore, you've got to know that when you deal with this, you're going to have to let people be people in a lot of situations. So verse 13 says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That means that they're going to continue in a way that they have been and continue to be until they find and know Christ for themselves. So sometimes you're going to let people say what they say, let them be how they are, let them do what they do. Because you're not going to be able to get them to stop mistreating you or, or creating conflict for you because that's their nature according to their choice of who they want to believe or not believe. That's where you're going to have to deal with those who live according to a relativism, those who live according to a pragmatism, 
So when you have to deal with them, you're going to have to allow them to be and know that your life will have to be an example in every way to those who will persecute you and those who will come to know Christ through you. Be confident in God's word in times of conflict. Don't let go of that word. Don't, don't turn from that word. Go further into the word. That means you've got to be willing to study now because the persecution will rise and grow greater. Grieve because there are many out there who now because of media and its uh, ease of access, we now see those false teachings and teachers more regularly. We hear them say things more frequently and we're, we're more subject to these things more continually. They can show up right outside the church after worship. They can get to you on your phone, call you and say they want to ask one thing and talk to you about a whole lot of other things that are not consistent with what they truly believe or, with the, or go against what you believe to get you to believe what they believe. It will happen, but you've got to know how to maintain and know the word of God and not shy away from it, but stand firm according to it. Here's the good news about how we stand firm to work. Times of conflict. Everyone is not at the same place of spiritual growth and maturity. There's still some who are bathed in Christ who are on milk. There are others who are on meat, Paul would say. There's some who have grown greatly and some who have grown just a little bit. But however, where you are, in your faith and trust in the word of God may not be at a greater level than someone else who's been walking with the Lord a little longer. It does not mean that the word of God has less power because you don't only know a certain understanding of scripture. And theirs has greater power because the same power in God's word is the power of God's word and the authority of God's word, whether you know one or two scriptures that you're living and holding on to, or if you know seven or eight scriptures that you're holding on to, it's got the same power and authority because it's the same word of God. So we should never become intimidated when you face those times and you're in conflict and people press against you and you feel like you just don't know what to do. And so you revert to ways that of your flesh rather than yielding to life in the spirit and saying, I'm going to take out his word and learn how to hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. Don't allow the level of your spiritual maturity to cause you to cower from your confidence in what you know of scripture. But also you have to know that where we can be confident, we all can be confident in God's word in times of conflict. We also can be confident in God's known word. Now, I just hit on that a little bit, but let's look at it in Scripture, God's known word. But verse 14, he says, But as for you, Paul says, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Verse 15, And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All right, I gave you a lot there. Let's back it up to verse 14 again. But as for you, continue on what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. So Paul now calls Timothy to rewind. Back it up. Replay. And consider the scripture he's learned. Oftentimes, we always look for the scripture we can get to know we don't always go back and reflect on the scripture we've already learned. Sometimes your best way to maintain and accomplish what you're needing to accomplish and to go forth in the assurance of what God's word is doing and has done and will do in your life is to remember the word you already know. Now watch this. That, that, that means that the known word is also the word that helps you progress to the word you're coming to know. We don't completely, fully comprehend all of Scripture, but we study to show ourselves approved. We do that because we know that there's a continuing evolution and growth and maturing that we experience 
by the word of God. Let's look at the 12 disciples. When they first came to hear Jesus say, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they decided they would go along with Jesus and follow him. But when Jesus began to teach the parables, they had to go to Jesus in private and say, Jesus, what's that mean? Jesus, I, I heard what you said, but I didn't quite get that. So they had to learn what Jesus was teaching. But they also had to learn who Jesus was. See, it's one thing to understand the teachings of the word. But if the teachings don't point you to the truth, who Jesus Christ is, then what good is teaching at all? Make you smart. You can go around and talk a whole lot of smart stuff. Be sound so sophisticated. And some people just love that. They just want to sound sophisticated. But what good is having such knowledge, but not having the relationship with the one that has made you knowledgeable in the ways of him as truth? Because it's the relationship that affords us the opportunity of confidence of the known word of God that leads us in the way of God through Jesus Christ for our life. Paul says continue. That means make progress. But he said don't make progress and try to get a whole lot of stuff you want to know. He said continue in what you already know. See, some not continuing what we already know helps us not become intimidated when someone comes in and says something we don't know. We, we, don't, we, we won't get shaken and, and, and get rocked if somebody comes in and tries to say something that, that we don't know because we can hold on to what we already know. And, and if we've learned and we firmly believe, hold to that faith. Don't allow yourself to find yourself giving up the known word because somebody's come in and said something to you that's caused you to feel uneasy or uncomfortable. Because not only do you find in the church there are those who will exercise some pragmatism within their Christian faith, which you can't have the two together, but some seek to go that way. Whatever works right now works. If I got to shout to get out, I'm going to shout to get out. If I got to uh, put some oil on me to get, to get the oil, the oil going to get me through. Or if I got to go out here and, 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 and do this or do that, whatever works. But it's the relationship that truly works. And the relationship means that I'm not going to look for whatever works. I'm going to trust that God is still working on me. And if he's still working on me, he knows exactly what to do because he's the potter and we just merely the clay. So we have to know that when we trust and take his words, we go through the experience, we have to trust the known word that we have and hold to it of what we learn and what we firmly believe. But now we have to hold to that word, but, but watch this. He says in verse 15, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. So the question comes, how did Timothy get to know the sacred writings since he was a child? That means we have to know that God gives us family. That's extended family. That's aunt, uncles, grandma, grandpa, mama, daddy, sister, brother. God has had surrounded Timothy with his mama and grandma who raised him. And through that, he came to know what? Scripture. The message version said that he had known uh, sacred writings from, uh, from the nursing of his mother. That's the picture they give us. So that's how early on that scripture had been his life. And what's a powerful picture of that is we get to see that we can be confident of God's word within our family. Sometimes within families, we can see grandma being a praying grandma, mama being a praying mama, daddy being a praying daddy, but it don't sometimes connect with our kids. Sometimes they're not always believing as we believe, seeing as we see. But we cannot stop con the continuation of making them familiar with the word. The word should be a part of the conversation of our homes. It should be a part of the context of our upbringing and our association and fellowship. And you'll be amazed at how when that happens, what the children sometimes will come back and say to grandma and grandpa to remind grandma and grandpa, hold on to your faith. Because you just heard something from your grandchild that you, had, that you need to hear, 
while you're going through. I shared on Sunday uh, past as we talked about fill this house about how going to grandma and grandpa's house and grandma in the kitchen cooking and they cook a good old meal and you come out the house and you go home and you start smelling your clothes and would you smell like their house, right? So, so on Sunday evening, my, my wife took uh, my boys. I had, well, I, she had to take care of some things for them, and they had things to do, and they were going some places that they had to handle some stuff because you know, our weeks are very busy. So she had to do those things with them, and they went by grandma and grandpa's house. They went by there. Grandpa had cooked up a mean meal, some cabbage and some baked chicken and some macaroni and cheese, and, and they got plates. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I know it's noontime. I didn't mean to make y'all hungry. I, 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 if you're watching, I hope you're enjoying your meal while we study. But, but, but we, they left, and they were riding along in the car, and my wife says, wow, I smell like chicken. And my son, my youngest one, said, that's just like what daddy said in the, house, in the sermon, that when you go to grandma and grandpa's house, now you come away smelling. And the same way we're supposed to smell when we've been in the presence of Jesus, we ought to have off the aroma. So he started repeating what he had heard in the sermon that connected with him, and he shared it again to remind my wife and to remind my oldest that we ought to have something that evidences that we are in the present experience with Christ. Why? Because the working of the word and, sake, and the teachings of the word ought to be familiar to our lives in every way. When we take God at his word, we can not only take it for what it does for us individually, we have to think of it and how it impacts our lives collectively. How the word that you take your time and that you are confident in, you can give that confident word to someone who's sick, someone who just lost a job, how you can be present to them. Now watch this. When we make an acquaintance with the word is not to go in quoting every scripture to every situation, but showing the demonstration of the word through how we live with people who are going through tough times. So Timothy's acquaintance with the word and the sacred writings were not only what he read and what was studied and taught, but what he experienced. Because oftentimes, the only way you can remain confident in the Word is to spend time in the Word, but then see how the Word works in your life through the experiences. And when we experience the pressures of a world that try to push against the Word and criticize a Word and tear down a Word and take a Word apart and say that the Word didn't mean that, 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 and try to tell us what we should believe about the Word of God that we're spending time with God in, trying to set up and make the Word tell you how to behave. Bible says people do this. Bible says people do that. That misses it. That's a legalism that we have to avoid so that we can know the fullness of relationships so that we know how after we've done all we can, we can stand. So Paul said that, Timothy, be confident because you got this word from early on in life and you got to experience it within your family. And then you can be confident because of what you got for you in your family. You can be confident because God's word guide you in salvation. Now watch this. I love what Paul says though. He doesn't just say that God's word brings you to salvation. He says God's word makes you wise for salvation. Watch this. Through faith in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Wise for salvation. That means that there's much more for us to learn through God's word for the salvation that we have received. Salvation is not just when you came down front, you gave the pastor your hand, and you said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord, and my, personal, my, my personal Lord and Savior over my life. I give my life to him. I give my life to Christ. That's not just when you went up the stairs and you professed your faith because you confessed it here, you professed it when you went down the water and were baptized. I hope y'all are catching the doctrine I'm helping y'all develop in this too. Doctrine is truth that we need to have because one of the things about seeing and experiencing the working of Scripture in life, we got to hold a doctrine. We confess our faith. We profess our faith. Confession, confess your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised his son from the dead. Romans 10, 9. We profess. Matthew 3, 15. Jesus said, I must be baptized, what? To fulfill all righteousness. So we profess, 
when we profess our faith, we show forth our faith to others that we have believed on the death and suffering of Christ and we have received that for the forgiveness of our sins that we have confessed and believed on what happened in him has now been done for us. So as we grab that doctrinal piece, as we experience that, we then take that on. But watch this. He says, it, the word makes you wise for salvation. Now, why do we need to be wise for salvation in a time where people are trying to cause us to not be confident in God's word? Why? Perhaps it's because you've got to understand your salvation in a greater way for the greater challenges you're going to face in a world that denies that your salvation ever happened. There are some believers who are going, who have left their faith and actually, they've gone through a process of being unsaved, unbaptized in the world. How do you undo something like that? But they're trying to take it off of them because they don't want anything to do with a denomination. They don't want anything to do with a devotion, a commitment to a word of truth. So there needs to be a wisdom about what the word of God says about salvation and about being saved, and about the ongoing work of salvation in our lives. Because if we don't have wisdom for salvation, we don't understand justification. We don't understand how the work Christ was for our justification. We don't understand sanctification, which means that God is still working his work in us, and he's not done with us yet. Praise the Lord. And that we look forward to glorification. Mm-hmm. That's what's yet to come. That's why you have to be wise in your salvation. So you know you've been justified by what? By faith. You're sanctified. That means the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you and has sealed you for the day of redemption. Because you are now belonging to God. You God's property. GP, are you with me? Oh, yeah. Throw a little Kirk Franklin on you. So we're justified, sanctified, and we shall be glorified. Now watch this. Paul says over in Rome, he said, our present sufferings are nothing in comparison with the glory that shall be revealed in us. But if we don't understand and have wisdom in our salvation, our suffering will take us out of our confidence in the scriptures because we don't, we don't recognize that glory is still yet coming. There will be glory after this. So when we are sure of the glorification that's to come, we can endure the time of sanctification where God continues to work on us, work in us, work through us to make us more like Christ in our lives. And we have a wisdom in our salvation. Watch this. Through our faith, our taking God and his word in Christ Jesus. That means we understand God's word gives us confidence for the salvation. It works, and as salvation is a work that God is doing in us, we don't become troubled, we don't become discouraged, we keep on going. Lastly, we realize that we can be confident in God's word because of what God's word achieves. Now watch that, that's, that's in the, the main body of this text, and I, I, I did this kind of in a surface way because we can really dive into these next three that shows you what God's word achieves. He says it right there in verses 16 and 17, 16 through 17. It says, all scripture uh -huh, is what? Breathed out by God. When we talk about being breathed out, we are talking about the fact that God's word is inspired by him. God's word is inspired by him. We can be confident because God's word is inspired by him because God's influence was divinely pressed upon the human experience and existence for the word they wrote according to what God wanted to, God desired to reveal of himself. That means when you read scripture, saying God's word breathed out means that God didn't just on the word. No, God made life through the word. 
He gave life through the word, and he, 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 he put it apart, rest upon that, 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 those who wrote those scriptures. And as they wrote, they were carried along by the Spirit in their writing. That's why we can know that scripture, even though man fails, God don't fail. God ain't got no error. And he said, man wrote the Bible. Man wrote the Bible. No, you missed it. It won't man writing the Bible. Just man sitting around saying, I'm going to write this Bible out. No, that ain't true. Let me, let me kick that myth out the door for you now. Theopnoestros, the Greek word. God breathed, which means that God carried along the writers for the writing that they wrote. Now, here's the crazy part. God didn't take out human error as far as what we do and where we fall short, the, the sin nature. He didn't take that out when he wrote his word. Because if he took it out, we probably wouldn't realize how much more we need God because we think we were already doing things that make us like God. God, he, 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 he put it in there that he told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And they still ate from the tree. He didn't take that out. He didn't take out that David took Bathsheba, who wasn't his wife, and didn't kill Uriah. He didn't take that out. He didn't take out in Judges that one of his own Levites took a concubine and was living with her when he wasn't supposed to do it. And then when he was pressed upon that they wanted to take him out of the house, the men came to the house and wanted to have him. And the book of Judges is there. And instead of taking, taking him, he pushed the woman out so they had her all night long. And when he came out, she was on the doorstep and he was about to step over her and leave her there. And instead he took her body, cut her pieces, and then sent her body out because he was trying to create uproar and up and rage against what had happened and blame others and cause some fighting amongst God's people. Whoa. See, that's why we got to get in God's word. Because it gives us confidence to understand that we can see how God's word work and see how God even still sent judges and those judges were there to what? Help turn people back to God who had turned from them. We need to see the truth of God's word that there were even the fact that when, when they came and arrested Jesus that the disciples scattered and ran from him. Struck the shepherd, the sheep scattered. Why do we need to see these things? Because God knew that we need to see how much more we needed him and that we can't do this thing called life without him. God breathed out. Carried along. So that we would know that scripture is profitable. Profitable. It says it's profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in what? Righteousness. How do we get our righteousness? Our righteousness comes by faith. So we need what? Teaching. Bible study. Spend time reading our word at home. Reproof. Things need to be straightened out in us. Correction. Where we're wrong, we need to be given the right. And for training, getting short on time, but I'm going to give you this real quick, and I'm going to touch this last one, and we're going we're gonna to finish the study up today. When I went to the military, I had to go through basic training. The necessity of training was so that I knew how to go forth and be a soldier. Without training, I wouldn't be a good soldier. You couldn't send me to go do a soldier's job without proper training. Why would God then let his people be his people without having proper training in his word? Proper teaching of his word. Proper understanding of his word. So that we know how to live in the righteousness that comes by faith through Jesus Christ. And we're not going around trying to create our own righteousness. That the man of God, man, generic man and woman, may be what? Complete, equipped, for every good work. Scripture is for equipping us. We've heard it said, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. He equips us for every good work. Here it is in Scripture, so now you know that God equips us. He makes us ready for good works. 
And I'm so glad he does the equipping work through his scripture because this is God's word has got him speaking to us. And if we're not equipped for the work we do, how can we go forth in the work we're called to take up? Because we won't know how to do good work without God's word. Because the work we do, we take it on as if it's supposed to glorify us, supposed to praise us, supposed to make us look good in everybody's sight. No, that's not what God's word is for. God's word is for us to be equipped for the good work and we need his word to understand how we do this good work so that we don't become arrogant so that we don't become discouraged that we don't run in fear and when we may fold or fail we know how to get up again and keep going we shared at the beginning of this year about Mark and we preached it through Mark for the year and we talked about how Mark was with Paul and how Paul did not want Mark to go on the next missionary journey because Mark had left them but how Mark seemingly turned it around from running and retreating to learning how to stand and run forward and to uphold the gospel. And later on, Paul says, send me Mark. Mark Mark's been good. Mark is blessing. Because Mark did not let the false start of his life keep him from starting over again. But he couldn't do that without what? Being made complete and equipped for the good work he was to do because of the word of God. So I pray today that you'll go back and spend some time with this text that will help you remain confident, sure, the word of God and his work in your life. For scripture is breathed out, it's profitable, and it equips. Where we sustain a hold of that truth in our lives, we can go forth in the fullness of all that the word of God teaches us for our living today. We will be pressed upon by those who will seek to persecute us for we believe that will challenge and go against what we believe. But we who have believed on the word of God must stand firm and remain confident. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this word today. Thank you for allowing us to share this teaching. God is so robust. It is so much more we can glean from this. So I pray for those who are present physically and those who are virtual that they would go back and sit with this scripture more. Not only see it as the words of Paul, pastorally to Timothy, but see that Timothy was really up against it because persecution was rising greatly. Christians were dying continually. They were being put into the Colosseums and they were being eaten alive. They were being burned. They were being mistreated. The pressures were great upon their life. And Timothy was in a place as young, trying to stand on the word, and he found himself challenged. God, we're at different seasons in our generations and our lives but we find ourselves struggling at times in pressured situations and sometimes within our families sometimes within our community oftentimes it is ourselves to remain confident in your word so God help us through this word to know the certainty of the things that we've been taught the surety of the word that is given to us from our young to our old age to know the power of your work and how it leads us in wisdom of salvation how it is breathed out, profitable, and equips us today. That in every way we live fully unto you, to the glory of you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. We love you, Lord, and thank you. Amen. God bless you. I pray you've been blessed by the service. Praying for you in this holy week as we march towards resurrection, knowing that he lives. God bless. Thank you for being a part of our worship service on today. Please take note of the following announcements and upcoming events. about the Beulah Grove Baptist Church, 
Please check us out on YouTube and Facebook or visit our website at buellgrove.org.